Thank you, Jonathan. That was beautiful. Thank you. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. And happy birthday. How does it feel to be 135? <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it? We can say that thus far, God has brought us here. And God has a vision. God has a destiny. And it's an eternal destiny that he's planning to take us. We're just beginning our journey. Just beginning. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you. Let's pray, shall we? Eternal Father in heaven, as we open your word and as we try to catch a glimpse of your character, your mind, your ways, your desires, and as we bond with you and as we become one with you and as we develop that trust, that love, that relationship, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the outpouring of your Holy Spirit so that the spiritual things, the supernatural things, will become real in our experience. Move our hearts, move our minds, lift us up beyond our circumstances, and help us to be on fire for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The history of the Cleburne Church is very closely interwoven with the history of the city of Cleburne. It started right around the same time, 1867. Cleburne is a western frontier town. And it was famous for the fact that it had the Chisholm Trail. And as a result, there were many, many cattle drives that would go through the town of Cleburne. There were cowboys, there were Indians, a lot of excitement. Today, we celebrate that rich tradition of Cleburne. If you go down 174, just south of town, you'll see the Sheriff's Posse Rodeo. Celebrate all of the activities, the rodeos. And then if you go out this way, 67, you'll see the Chisholm Trail Outdoor Museum the silhouettes of the cattle drive. And it reminds you of the rich, rich history. So I want to start off this morning by telling you a story of a cowboy. His name was Mr. Sanderson. And he had a remarkable horse. I love horses, don't you? I think they're the most beautiful thing in existence. Well, he had a remarkable horse. His horse was named Nightlight. And he would enter his horse, Nightlight, into a rodeo competition. Now, this rodeo competition was called Cutting Cattle. Cutting Cattle. There would be 10 cows in the arena. Five cows would have tags in their ear. And the other five cows would not have tags in their ear. The competition required that the cowboy get on his horse, charge into the herd of cows, and then the horse would 
do his fancy footwork. And he'd isolate the cows and separate the cows into two separate groups of tagged cows and untagged cows. And that's the way they cut the cattle. It all depended on the fast reflexes and movements, legwork of the horse, and how the cows reacted and responded. Well, the whistle blew, and nightlight just shot out of the chute. He just charged into the arena. Without any fear, without any hesitation, he started with one cow, and he'd do his fancy footwork, and one went this way. Then he'd go the other way, and the other one went this way. And he just maneuvered until finally all the cows were divided. Five tagged, five untagged. And then, after he finished, he just shot into the winner circle and stopped right there. The whistle blew. And the announcer announced the time that night light took to divide the cows. And it was a record-breaking time. He had broke the new world record. He had made it. When he announced the time, the crowd just stood up, and they applauded, and they yelled, and they were exuberant because he had set a new world record. Now you say, <laughs> well, what's so, what's so exciting about setting records? I mean, they do that all the time. The unique thing about nightlight was that nightlight, the horse, was born blind. He had congenital blindness. He was born blind. When nightlight was just born, he was so fearful, so fearful, he just stood still. He stood still. And Mr. Sanderson would have to gently, consistently, patiently nudge him to take a step. Come, nightlight. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Take a step. And over days, over weeks, over months, over years, nightlight developed a bond, a bond of trust with Mr. Sanderson. As a result, he had in Implicit obedience. Whenever Mr. Sanderson let loose of the reins, nightlight would explode. Whenever he just used the neck reins and just tilted to the left, nightlight shot to the left. Whenever he moved to the right, he shot to the right. Whenever he yelled back, he stopped. Instantly, automatically, whenever he pulled the reins gently, nightlight would back, back up. Nightlight, even though he was blind, had implicit trust. Implicit trust. He could go into an arena filled 
with cows, with horns, no fear, no hesitation. And he would just respond to his master's signals with the neck reins. Now I tell you that story because that story illustrates a profound spiritual lesson. And that is obedience, true, genuine, spiritual obedience springs from, is a byproduct of a relationship of trust and of love. Christ said, if ye love me, it takes time to learn to love. It takes time to learn to trust. Keep my commandments. The righteous are described four times in the Bible. Habakkuk, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. The word faith in Greek is pistis, and it can be translated faith, belief, or trust. Those three, they're interchangeable. One word, one Greek word for three English translations. The way you translate it is contingent on the context. In other words, the just, the righteous, live by trust by faith. Now, <clears throat> I want to take that principle. I want to take that principle and bring it to another story. And this is a story that illustrates a corporate, a corporate developing of trust. A corporate development of yielding and surrendering, a corporate development of obedience. And it culminates with the Ebenezer Stone. The Ebenezer Stone, if you turn to your Bibles, is found in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Now, <clears throat> inspiration says, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 591, that this was a great, it was a huge stone. It was a huge, great stone. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, it tells us, Then Samuel took a stone... That's a great stone. And set it up between Mispeth and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Thus far, thus far, God has brought us to this place. Now, <clears throat> The story of the Ebenezer Stone is a fascinating story. And I'm sure you've heard of it many, many times. You've read about it. And, and I'm sure that there's nothing really new about this passage. But every time I read the Scriptures and every time I study the Scriptures. There's always something new, always something different that, that I begin to see. The Scriptures are like a diamond that when you look at it, you see a certain perspective and you see the glimmer. But then you keep on looking at it and twisting and you see other facets other dimensions. And the more you study the Scriptures, 
the unfathomable it becomes. You can never exhaust the Word of God. But now, in order to understand what's going on here, you have to understand the setting, the background. You have to understand where did God lead His people? From what? How long? This event takes place around 1050 B.C. It's just about the time that King Saul is going to reign. And it's, and it's right, right at the culmination of the period of the judges. Now, there was an overlap between the period of the judges, because of Samuel, and the period of the monarchy, because of Saul. There was an overlapping. But now, if you look at the book of Judges, which is just before this period. The book of Judges represents a time span of about 330 years. 330 years. There are 12 judges that are mentioned. 12 judges that are mentioned. And then, after that, there's Eli, who the Bible says judged Israel for 40 years, and then after him, Samuel. And Samuel is in his years, he's about 40 years at about this time, and he became a judge at 20, so you have 20 years. So you have almost, almost 400 years, 400 years, the time of the judges. Now, the time of the judges was a dark, dark period in the history of Israel. It was a dark period because when you analyze it, when you analyze it, you see a pattern that seems to surface. A pattern. It's a pattern of a roller coaster. It goes up and down, up and down. And if you read it, you will see that they are in bondage. They're in bondage. They cry out to the Lord. And the Lord sends a deliverer and delivers them from the oppression. And then they go back to bondage. And then they cry out to the Lord. And God sends a deliverer. And you see the pattern repeated. They go into bondage from the Midianites, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Ammonites. And three times they're in bondage to the Philistines. Three times. So you see a pattern. You see a pattern. And then you ask yourself, why? I mean, don't we generally learn from our past? Why? Why, why does it keep repeating itself? And then you read the Scriptures, and twice it tells us, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so they reaped the consequences of their own choices. They went up and they went down. But that's one pattern. That's one pattern. And when you look at man, you see that pattern. But now I want you to rise your perspective, and look at it from a theological perspective. 
look at it from God's point of view. What does the book of Judges tell us about God? It's not explicit. It's implicit. You have to read between the lines. Remember I said, every time, every time they were oppressed, they were lamenting, they cried out to God. And every time, every time, God responded. God was consistent. God was constant. God was long-suffering. God was forgiving. God was merciful. God was accepting. God kept working with them. He didn't give up on them. Isn't that a wonderful God? God is a tenacious, tenacious lover. Tenacious. He doesn't let go, and he doesn't give up. Well now, if you look at this pattern, you'll find that even though the people of God lamented, they never repented. They never changed their ways. They just didn't like the situation that they were in. <laughs> they didn't like the consequences. They, they were being suppressed. Now, according to Josephus, a Jewish historian, Samuel was about 12 years old when he was sleeping in the temple at the most holy place, the temple in Shiloh, and he hears the voice of God calling him. He responds after three times, and God tells him, Hey, I am going to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone that hears it tingle. I'm going to make it, I'm going to startle them. I'm going to make them tingle. Wow. <laughs> what are you going to do, God? God had already said what he was going to do. He told them that he was going to take the priesthood lineage. You remember on Mount Sinai, God said that he would establish the priesthood with Aaron and his descendants forever. And now God is saying, I can't do that anymore. I'm going to take it away from the descendants of Aaron. And I'm going to put it into the hands of somebody who has a heart like mine. Well, <clears throat> that was the prophecy. And the Bible says that Samuel grew. And the Lord was with him. And the Bible says that all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. People knew. He didn't have to announce it. They could tell by his lifestyle there was something different. There was something spiritual about Samuel. Now, mind you, he was a Nazarite. He was born out of a fervent mother's prayer. And he was a Nazarite, so he had long hair. I imagine as he was older, you could see him walking into the different towns of Israel with his long flowing white hair that touched and kissed the earth. That was Samuel. He was still a teenager at that time. And the Bible says that the word of the Lord was rare. About the time he's 20, you know, there's always tensions between the Philistines and the Israelites. And this tension erupted into a battle. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Israel, Israel camped their armies, their forces in Ebenezer. And the Philistines camped their forces in Arpak. And the Philistines and the children of Israel fought. They fought. And the Bible says that the Philistines conquered the children of Israel. 4,000 were killed. And then the children of Israel, they go back home to Shiloh, and they start asking the question, why? 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 Why, God, did you allow this humiliation to happen to us? We are your people. Why did you allow this? And so they're thinking and frustrated and humiliated, discouraged. And then they begin to think, we've got to try a new approach. We have got to have God with us. If God be with us, who can be against us? Now, they didn't know Paul at that time, but that's in the New Testament. But that's basically their thinking. That's basically their thinking. We're going to have God with us. And so they decide, let's take the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. Let's take that into the battle. After all, it's been in the battle before. It was in the battle that destroyed Jericho. Do you remember when Jericho was uh, encompassed every day for six days and then seven times in the seventh day and how it all fell? And so they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield. And when they bring it into the battlefield, there's a loud, loud roar. Everybody's excited. The Philistines hear this. They look into the field and they see that the God of Israel is in the battlefield. And they say, how can this be? The gods of Israel are in the battlefield. They're the gods that slew the Egyptians. Woe be unto us. This has never happened before. The God of Israel has come to fight us. And they were afraid. They were fearful. And so what happens? They begin to talk to each other. And they said, look, let's be men. Let's fight. Just because they have their gods, we have our gods. They've been suppressed by us. Their gods haven't delivered them. Our gods, Dagon, is greater than their gods. Be men. Fight. And so they fight. They fight. The story is a sad story. It's a sad story. Because in the end, the Israelites are defeated. They're defeated not only physically, but they're defeated psychologically. They're devastated now because they thought they had pulled out their trump card. They thought that by having the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God Almighty, that they would win the battle. And they lost. Their expectations of God and what God would do for His people were shattered. They were shattered. 30,000 men died. The Ark of the Covenant was captured. Hophni and Phinehas, the priests that brought the Ark into the battlefield, were killed. And then, when a Benjaminite 
goes back into Shiloh to report what had happened in the battlefield. His garments are torn and he has sand on them as if he were in sackcloth and ashes. That's the appearance of deep grief in Israel. And he comes to Shiloh and he reports the news and he tells Eli the high priest. Eli hears the news that the Philistines have defeated the Israelites and have captured the ark. And as a result, he falls backward, breaks his neck, dies. And then his daughter-in-law, Phineas, his wife, she was just about at term, just about ready to deliver. She begins to have labor pains. And she gives birth. And she dies at birth giving birth. And she calls her son Ichabod, meaning that the glory of the Lord has left Israel. That's a sad day. It's sad. I mean, it's depressing. I mean, remember, remember, this is about 400 years after them coming into Canaan. Now stop. Think about this. They were 400 years in slavery in Egypt. They wander 40 years in the hot desert. Whole generation dies off. And now they come to the promised land. The land of milk and honey where all of their dreams are all of their expectations were going to be fulfilled. And they're being oppressed, being kept in servitude for almost 400 years. And now this, the presence of God, is not with them. Oh, it was a dark day. It was a dark day. Dark day. But then the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant and they moved it to several cities and every time they moved it they suffered from tumors and so after seven months they decide that they're going to return the Ark. The Ark brought them sickness, brought them suffering, and they thought that it was a curse. They wanted to return the ark. So they figure out a plan how to return the ark. They put it in a cart. They, they had two cows that were milking their calves, carrying or leading the ark. And they carry it to Keresh Jerem. And when they carried it there, they left the ark there for 20 years, 20 years. It was basically ignored, basically ignored. And now the children of Israel, they're still in bondage, they're still in servitude, they're still oppressed. Now they begin to lament they begin to think about their life. They begin to think, you know, there's something missing. Something missing. There, there has to be more. There has to be more. They're in the bottom of the pit. And they come to Samuel. Samuel's about 40 years old now. They come to Samuel and they say, Samuel, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm at the bottom. I'm at the bottom of my barrel. Is there any hope? Is there any hope after all these years? Is there any hope? What can we do? 
Samuel doesn't mince any words. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, he says these words. If, there's a condition, if you return to the Lord with all, all, not some, not 95%, but all, of your hearts, all of your hearts, and put away, put away all of these foreign gods, all of these Baals, all of these Ashtoreths, put it away, put God first, completely, and serve only the Lord, serve only the Lord with all your heart, then God will deliver you. He will deliver you from the Philistines. That was the condition. That was the condition. The condition was give all your heart to the Lord. Don't mingle it with any other foreign gods. And you notice in the next verse, the Bible says that Israel put away all of their gods, the Baals, the Ashtras, and they served the Lord only, only. This is the first time, first time that there is corporate repentance in Israel. Corporate repentance. First time. Now, this is the interesting thing. God's people are coming back to God. They're repenting. They want to serve the Lord with all their hearts. Now, let me tell you something. Do you think that the devil likes that? <laughs> Absolutely not. Whenever, whenever you have an impulse, an inkling from the Holy Spirit to recommit your life, to study your Bible more, to pray, to serve Him. You rattle the devil's cage. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like it one bit. And he's going to do everything he can to discourage you. So, the children of Israel come. They're having a revival. They're going through reformation. They're shouting. They have prayed. They have fasted. It's a glorious occasion. And the Philistines are on top of the mountain, and they're looking down. And they're saying, what is all the focus Going, what's all the, the, the ruckus? What's all that noise? What, what's going on? And so they decide, we have got to spoil this party. We've got to come in there, and we've got to teach them we are the masters, and they are the slaves. Just about the time that Samuel takes a young offering. The children of Israel become afraid. They're afraid. And they come to Samuel and they, sa they say to Samuel, Samuel, please, please intervene for us. Pray for us. We need divine intervention. Samuel, now with a clear conscience, can ask God, God, intervene. Do your thing. And the Bible says there was thunder, a great thunder and lightning that came. That's what the Bible says. But if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, page 591, 
inspiration elaborates on this story. There was a lightning storm, huge, tremendous, severe lightning storm, thundering from the heavens. And the Philistine warriors were struck by lightning. lightning. And she says, there were many dead Philistine warriors shrewn all over the earth. All over the earth. The children of God, they look. Wow! Wow! Our enemies have been defeated by the power of the Almighty, lightning from heaven. And after they get through the initial shock and awe, they go down the valley. They take the spears and the swords from the dead soldiers, and they pursue, and they pursue the Philistines all the way down to Bethkar. And then Samuel takes a huge stone, huge stone, and he says, this is Ebenezer, the stone of help, the stone of help. Hitherto has the Lord helped us. Thus far, thus far has the Lord helped us. What a change, what a change from dark, dismal depression and, and difficult circumstances to victory, to light, to liberation. The Bible says that the Philistines returned the land that they had taken back to the Israelites, and that the Ammonites made peace with the Israelites, and all during the life of Samuel there was peace. Now Samuel died at about the age of 82 or 3 or something like that. So you talk about over 40 years period of peace. That's the second longest time span of peace during the time of the judges. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Ellen White makes the statement in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 188, the Christian should often review his past life and recall with gratitude the precious deliverances that God has wrought for him, supporting him in trial, opening ways before him when all seemed dark and forbidding, refreshing him when ready to faint, he should recognize all of them as evidences of the watch care of the heavenly angels. I know that God has done a lot in my life, and I know in some of your lives, God has intervened. God has brought you back to health. God has provided for you. And if you look back, if you look back and just reminisce, you see the mercy, the long-suffering, the compassion of God. And as we look back as a church, we can look back 135 years and see how God, how God provided. In 1875, when the population of Cleburne was only 1,500, evangelist Robert Kilgore held meetings. 300 people attended. That's one-fifth of the town's population. And twice the winds blew and tumbled the tents and destroyed the tents. And they rebuilt. God's people persevered. 
You would think that that would get them discouraged. But they kept on keeping on. And then in 1878, they built a church. First church we had. And it was destroyed by a tornado right after it was built. It was destroyed into pieces, the historian says. But God's people persevered. In 1911, there was another church, the church that was built in Sunset and Featherston, and it was built debt-free, debt-free. 1969, this church was built. At that time, we only had about 213 members. The land was donated by your mother and father, uh, Elvin and Julia Walthrop. We've had several lightning strikes. The first lightning strike hit the top there, and the church members decided that rather than just repair the hole, they would build the balcony. That balcony is a memorial to the fact that good came out of bad. And in 1995, we built the Family Life Center. Pastor Rick Peterson worked hard. 1998, we built the school. Got that going. Now I believe we have about 38 students or so. Is that correct? 38? And three teachers. Then 2007, we started the Hope Clinic, and we've seen 23 patient visits. Ellen White says it's good, it's good to reflect, to reflect and see the hand of God working. She says in Life Sketches, page 196, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of our advance to our present standing, I can say, Praise God. As I see what God has done, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. And then she says the classic statement. We have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves us tenaciously, tenaciously, with an everlasting love. We may, we may be human. We may be fickle, and we are. We may have our ups and downs, but God loves us. And God isn't finished yet with the Cleveland Church. The Bible says that we can be confident in the fact that what God has started, He will bring to completion. He will bring it to completion. And as I see the demographics of Cleveland, the city of Cleveland, right now we have about 30,000 population. They're saying, and they're estimating, that when Highway 121 comes in, the population of Cleburne will be anywhere between 65 to 75,000. That's over doubled. Now, stop and think. Stop and think. We started in 1876 to 2013, over about 135 years, 30,000, 30,000 in 135 years. And now, in the next 10 to 12 years, we're going to be over doubled. That's going to be a tremendous, tremendous challenge for us as a people to reach all of these people coming in. 
with all of their needs. In 1735, a little baby by the name of Robert Robinson was born in England. When he was eight years old, his father died, and his mother was left all alone to take care of him. Now, he was a bright little boy, full of energy. He was, he was vivacious, but he was very strong-willed, <laughs> very hard-headed. And he was a little difficult to manage for his mother, being a widow. Finally, they came to an agreement at age 14. He would leave home and go to London, where he would learn to be a barber. When he got into London, he started hanging around the wrong crowd, started drinking, started gambling, started carousing. And he wasn't doing very well. He wasn't really happy in life. When he was 17, he heard about an evangelistic meeting that was being conducted in London by George Whitfield. And he decided that he and his drinking buddies would go and they'd listen. They wanted to make fun of George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a very dynamic, passionate speaker. And he was very animated and they wanted to kind of rib him a little bit. But Robert listened, didn't say a word, didn't respond, and then left the meeting, kept the words of his heart, of, of George Whitfield in his heart. And it haunted him. It haunted him for three years. Three years. And then finally, he decided, I'm going to give my heart all of my heart to the Lord. I'm going to surrender my life to Him. And He did. Then He felt the Holy Spirit talk to Him and say, you need to serve me in the ministry. And so He did. Three years in the ministry, he was preaching at a Calvinist Methodist chapel in Norfolk, England. And he wrote a song that would complement his sermon. The song was, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And in the second stanza, he says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Here I raise my memorial stone. Hither by thy help I've come. I've come this far only by the grace and mercy of God. And I hope by thy good pleasure by grace, safely to arrive at home. We're not home yet. We're not home yet. We've got a little bit more to go. We were destined to be with God. We were destined to be with Him in eternity. We've just got a little more to go. God has led us this far, and God will bring us to Him and to our eternal home. If this is your desire. If you want to give your heart to the Lord, fully rededicate your life, I invite you to turn to hymn number 334. Hymn number 334, and let's stand and let's sing all the stanzas. Let's sing all the stanzas. <laughs> 